jumping into the world of Dante. Well done. You are about to embark on a journey through one of the greatest works of art ever produced. It will be difficult, but totally worth it. I promise. I know there will be a significant amount of details that will completely go over your head. The names, events, controversies, factions, and relationships that fill up the pages of the comedy are almost entirely foreign to us. To that end, study guides, summaries, and notes can be enormously helpful. I hope you pick up mine. However, before one does a deep dive into Dante, there is a better way to jump in. First, don't worry about the names. They can really be a distraction for the first-timer. In most cases, if you simply stop trying to figure it out and look at what that person is doing or is said to have done, it becomes easy enough to see the general principle that the poet is trying to communicate. For instance, in Canto Three of Paradiso, you don't really need to know all the details of Picarda's life to understand and be deeply encouraged by her famous speech that ends with, In the will of the king is our peace. Next, read it first and foremost as a story. Submit to it and see where it takes you. Enter into the imagery. Let Dante create in your mind a landscape, it won't be hard, through which you are walking with the pilgrim. Step into that world and look around. Notice what sounds you hear, what you taste, what you see and can feel. Are there any smells that come to mind? For instance, before entering the fifth ditch of Malbolge, the eighth circle of hell, Dante the poet describes in an extended simile the shipyards of Venice, all of which prepares the reader for the sights of the barriters in the thick pitch that was bubbling there below. As in the arsenal of the Venetians in winter, they boil a tenacious pitch for the recoating of unseaworthy boats. For unable to set sail, this one makes a new vessel, and that one recocks the ribs of his boat that has made many voyages. This one hammers away at the prow, and that one at the poop. Some make oars, and others twist the tackle, another patches the sails. Thus, not by fire, but by the art divine, a thick pitch was bubbling there below, that was pasting every side of the bank. Inferno, Canto 21, lines 6 through 18. Notice the sounds of hammers. The smell of paint, the feel of the tackle, the taste of pitch in the air, and the sight of steam rising from the boiling cauldrons through the wintry chill. Dante is inviting you into the scene to experience it all, and to carry that experience with you, letting it shape you and ultimately transform you into the kind of reader who can stand with him at the very end and enjoy, in the fullness of what that word means, the beatific vision. At its most basic level, Inferno is about the nature of sin, Purgatorio, the nature of sanctification, and Paradiso, the nature of holiness. In each part of the journey, though this will perhaps be easier in Inferno and Purgatorio, you should try to proactively identify with the pilgrim. In other words, take seriously the notion that this is the journey of every man, the journey of nostra vita, our shared experience of being human. What sins can you relate to? Hint, there are some that even the pilgrim relates to more than others. What habits would you like to see change, and how does the activity of those being purged help toward that end? What areas in your life need to be reoriented around Christ, and how do the stories of the various saints in heaven inspire you? This is your journey, too. Keep that in mind as you move forward through the various realms Dante imagines. And finally, do your best to simply enjoy the ride. This is high art, yes, but it is also really, really fun. It is less like a painting and more like a roller coaster. A painting is something you stare at and come to appreciate over time. A roller coaster is something you step into and allow to whisk you away. Don't worry about understanding everything your first time through. Don't worry about looking up everything you don't understand. There will be time for that later. This first time through, just sit down and enjoy it. Another translation? To date, there are over 100 translations of the whole comedy or of an individual canticle from the original Italian into English. So why another one? Obviously, I can't speak for every translator, but I am convinced that no one translates Dante first and foremost for the sake of others. Translating the comedy is entirely a selfish affair. One translates Dante to know Dante that much better, 
to grapple with the medieval Italian, to be able to transform his mother tongue into one's own, to try and rehearse the story with words and phrases that have more immediacy to a non-Italian speaker. At least that was why I wanted to take up this project. Since I first revisited him almost a decade ago, I have read the comedy many times in multiple translations. I have collected almost 20 different versions over the years, as well as the rest of Dante's works. I have also had occasion to do some scholarly work on both the comedy and his lesser-known philosophical treatise, the Convivio. The time had come to stop writing about Dante, and to stop reading Dante as conceived by others, and to read him in his original tongue. Fortunately, modern Italian is virtually built on Dante's own Tuscan dialect as represented in his poetry. While there are quite a few Latinisms and medievalisms, he died 700 years ago after all, a reading knowledge of Italian, along with a couple of good commentaries on the Italian text, to be mentioned below, is sufficient to get one started in the original. And so the translation project began. Initially, I was going to be content creating an interlinear version where the English translation appears beneath each line in the Italian, maintaining the Italian word order. But then I decided to transpose that very literal, very wooden translation into a readable English prose. That work can be found in a separate volume published by Roman Rhodes Press. However, that is when things started getting out of control. My love for Dante's work grew into a desire to share that work with others. I started creating a study guide for some unknown set of students, complete with legends, summaries, analyses, and discussion questions, also available as part of this series. And finally, having published a few volumes of original poetry myself, I couldn't help but envision a poetic edition of my own creation. Thus the volume you are holding was born. It began as a desire to know Dante better, for my own pleasure. But there is such richness here, it will not stay contained. It must be shared. Which is why there will always be room for more translations. Each translation is an opportunity to share in someone else's delight in this poem. To catch a bit of the excitement from their own time with the Florentine. That delight will naturally focus on different aspects of the poem, based on the interests and leanings of the translator, theological, cosmological, political, anthropological, or what have you. But that delight is the key ingredient. You cannot get on in any kind of education or growth or self-improvement without delight. Delight is the only thing that takes the lesson being learned and drives it deep into the bones. This book is an invitation to you to share with me in my own delight in the richness of this poem. Why blank verse? Dante wrote his comedy in what is known as terza rima, or basically, rhyming tercets. They are 11 syllable lines, with a few exceptions, broken into three line stanzas with a rhyme scheme of ABA, BCB, CDC, DED, and so forth. To replicate this, I chose the time tested common meter of English blank verse. Blank verse is an unrhymed 10 syllable line, usually broken up into five iambic feet, iambic indicating the location of the stresses, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. Other translators have used different schemes. Dorothy Sayers memorably tried to replicate Dante's terza rima exactly. Clive James more recently chose rhyming quatrains to replicate each rhyming tercet. The Hollanders used something closer to free verse, meaning without rhyme or a consistent meter. And then others, like Derling, skip the poetry altogether and simply replicate the meaning of the Italian in English prose. Each approach has its benefits and its challenges. I chose blank verse because a rhyming scheme constrains the English too much, in my opinion, often forcing a funky syntax. With so many inversions, the text becomes difficult to read. Notice the difference between the following translations of the opening Italian tercet. Sayers Midway this way of life were bound upon, I woke to find myself in a dark wood, where the right road was wholly lost and gone. James At the midpoint of the path through life I found myself lost in a wood so dark the way ahead was blotted out. The keening sound I still make shows how hard it is to say. Hollander Midway in the journey of our life, I came to myself in a dark wood, for the straight way was lost. Durling In the middle of the journey of our life, I came to myself in a dark wood, for the straight way was lost.
Sayers captures Dante's rhyme scheme. James, with his quatrains, gives himself room to communicate more of the meaning of the Italian. Hollander is more literal, a very close approximation of the Italian words, but with a poetic slant. Durling is the most literal, with an exact word-for-word -word replication in prose. However, Sayers has to modify normal English syntax and add extra words to accomplish her goal, however admirable. This leads to communicating more than what Dante originally intended. James, too, with his extra line in unpacking the sense, often adds more than what Dante put in, almost explaining too much and not letting the original vision of the poet take precedence. Hollander's translation, while quite literal, reads more like prose broken up into lines than poetry. And Durling's is prose. What I wanted to do, and I don't claim that I have done it perfectly, is to be as literal as Durling and Hollander are, while maintaining a true poetic feel. Here is my interlinear translation of these same lines, so you get a feel of the Italian. Nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita, in the middle of the course of our life, mi ritrovai per una selva oscura, me I found in a wood dark. Que la derita via era smarita, for the right way was lost. And here, as you will soon read, is my blank verse rendition. In the middle of the course of our life, I came to myself in a darkened wood, because the right direction had been lost. I bolded the stresses to show that I don't use a consistent iambic pentameter, like in the third line, as that has the danger of becoming sing-songy. While appropriate for shorter poems, like sonnets, long-form poetry and straight iams could become intolerable. For comparison's sake, here is H. F. Carey's 1805 translation of these lines, which maintains a consistent iambic pentameter. In the midway of this our mortal life, I found me in a gloomy wood astray, gone from the path direct and e'en to tell. To be clear, I don't at all make these comparisons to claim superiority. They are very fine translations and accomplish what the translators set out to do. I am merely explaining my own preference in order to give background to what you are about to read. And to that end, here are four tips for reading poetry in general, and this volume in particular. 1. Allow the natural stresses of the words to dictate the flow of the sentence. Different words have different stress lengths depending on the placement of the vowels and the number of consonants. For example, the words to and flinch are both one-syllable words, but you can tell one takes less time to say than the other. Furthermore, a short word like to naturally leads you into the next word, ending with a vowel as it does, whereas you want to land on flinch a little, taking just a moment before moving on. Read the following naturally while paying attention to the space you give between the words. To flinch means to make a quick movement in reaction to something. Notice the lack of space between the three instances of two, and the space following the harder sounds of flinch, make, quick, and movement. This is how the English language works, and you shouldn't fight it when reading, especially when reading poetry. 2. Read according to the punctuation, not the line break. The line breaks because the number of syllables allotted that line have been used up, not because a breath is required. Pay attention to the natural breaks in the syntax, the commas, the semicolons, the periods. Also, like I mentioned above, pay attention to the flow of the words themselves, and let the natural stresses dictate your enunciation and your rests. 3. Read the poem aloud and slowly. Taste the words on your tongue. Let their sounds fill your eustachian tubes, bringing the words directly to your ears, as well as traveling around your cheeks and hitting them from the outside. This process will encourage and cultivate your ability to enter into the story, imaginatively accepting the imagery of the poem as the landscape you are inhabiting. 4. Lastly, for extra credit, you can listen for moments of alliteration, repetition of certain consonants, assonance, repetition of certain vowel sounds, parallelisms, and chiasmi. But these are technical aspects of the poetry, more fitting as background than the main show. Therefore, it is not necessary to pay strict attention to them, though they are there. It can seem daunting, I know. And as many have said, once you have read the comedy straight through, you are finally ready to read the comedy. But as I said above, the goal of the first read-through is simply to enjoy it, 
and gather what you can without worrying about getting everything. No one can possibly gather every breadcrumb Dante puts down the first time through. But it is a poem that rewards multiple read-throughs, our appreciation growing richer and deeper each time, as well as the harvest of blessing it offers to our own walks with the Lord. Dante is teaching us what it means to be human, to live before God and before one another. It is a lesson we need to learn many times over. Why did I do this? For those of you who are still with me and are interested in some deeper background, the next two sections relate something of what got me interested in Dante in the first place. Naturally, it starts with C.S. Lewis. I had just finished Michael Ward's phenomenal Planet Narnia, and I was hooked. The cosmology of the ancients and medievals was beyond anything I had ever conceived. I had to know more. I was captivated by this foreign way of understanding the universe that Lewis was steeped in, read especially his series of lectures collected in The Discarded Image, and was eager to discover where that worldview came from. It was clear that Lewis was a tremendous admirer of Dante, as we will see, and that was good enough for me. I had read the comedy at lightning speed back as an undergrad, but didn't really appreciate what I was reading. Who really does as a 20-year-old? But Lewis's delight became my delight, and that delight launched me back into the old medieval poem, with new eyes to appreciate what the early 14th century Florentine poet was up to. Medieval cosmology, or what the modern era has named in its typical modernistic way, geocentrism, as a scientific theory is of course absolutely bunk. The sun is not a planet, but is the center of our solar system. However, as a literary model, that pre-modern cosmology is absolutely brilliant, allowing for a far richer understanding of the heavens and of our place in them. As both the ancients and medievals conceived it, the universe was a giant sphere with several smaller spheres within. Think of a giant Russian nesting doll. At the very center is the Earth. Orbiting the Earth in consecutive spheres are the seven planets, the Moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Beyond Saturn is the sphere of the fixed stars, or constellations. They remain in their places as the whole field rotates around them. Finally, there is the crystalline sphere, or prima mobile. This is the outermost sphere of the universe, from man's perspective. Beyond the prima mobile is the presence of God, or the Empyrean heaven. Thus, from his perspective, the prima mobile is the first sphere, and therefore, in the medieval and Aristotelian understanding, the first sphere that is set into motion by his love. That sphere moves the stars, which in turn move Saturn all the way down to the moon. At the center, beholding this cosmic dance, is Earth. Thus, when Dante stepped out of an evening and looked up into the heavens, he took for granted that he was looking up into life, into harmony, into abundance, and, eventually, had he the eyes to see it, into the very throne room of God itself. But he didn't have the eyes. He was a fallen, sinful man who lived separated from that joy and vivacity. Contrary to what moderns might think, the center of the universe was not the most important part. To Dante, it meant that he was at that point that was furthest from God. He was shut out of the cosmic dance by sin. The goal was to ascend, to go further up and further in, to travel through the spheres and dwell with God in the Empyrean, in his very presence. That is the literary force of the Ptolemaic worldview that had captured my own imagination, transforming what I had thought of as merely vacuous space into something living and breathing, something rich in transcendent meaning and overwhelming in magnitude and glory. Suddenly, Psalm 19 made sense. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them He has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Psalm 19, verses 1-6, through 6, ESV That is how my love affair with Dante began. This cosmological worldview reaches its apotheosis in his comedy, 
developed there in more detail and with more theological richness than is found anywhere else. If anyone can re-enchant our modern mechanistic materialism, in which the world is simply one big machine running like a clock with all its gears in place, it is Dante. Back to the Lewis-Dante connection. Now for the background of the background. I think it will be helpful in setting the stage to see just what it was about Dante that enchanted Lewis so much, at least if you're a Lewis geek like me. In a paper presented to the Oxford Dante Society in the early part of 1940, Lewis makes the argument that, quote, the best poetry is not that which contains the fewest elements proper to prose. I think the greatest prose and poetry are least unlike each other, and that Dante has proved it, end quote. What he meant was that poetry is not necessarily in its best and most profound state when prosaic elements are wholly absent. In other words, the best poetry, Lewis argues, maintains a certain connection with prose, a connection which allows its readers to easily identify and recognize the meaning of the verse. Praising Dante, he says, quote, There is so much besides poetry in Dante that anyone but a fool can enjoy him in some way or other, whereas a poem like John Milton's The Cidus is merely poetry and therefore utterly detestable to the rather large class of critics who have a secret dislike of poetry, end quote. It is inferred that this secret dislike of poetry comes from a weariness with poetry that is both esoteric and highfalutin. The Divine Comedy proves that high poetry does not need to be stuffy, abstruse, obscure, or otherwise annoying. Rather, high poetry can maintain a certain immediacy, excitement, movement, and a real down-to-earthness. Lewis explains this quality of Dante by noting at least two aspects of his great work. First are Dante's extended similes. Quote, they are all the kind of similes which a philosopher could use in prose. They are there in the first place, perhaps, because he is writing as the popularizer of the best thought of his time. End quote. In other words, his similes, which are legion, are plain, normal, understandable, and drawn from common life experiences. They bring our pre-existing experiences to the text, allowing us to all the more quickly understand what Dante is trying to describe. Secondly, this union of poetry and prose that creates a more engaging work comes from what Lewis identifies as Dante's old-fashioned plain sense. Quote, Dante is the most translatable of the poets, not probably that he entrusts less wealth than others do to the music of the words and the nuance of the phrase, but that he entrusts more than others to the plain sense. End quote. What he means is that, while certainly a brilliant technician and craftsman, it is not to the technical aspects that Dante entrusts the driving force and weight of his poem. Though these aspects are present and truly awe-inspiring when seen, the force of the poem is found in the on-the-surface sense of the words. Dante says what he means, and he means what he says. There are certainly layers to peel back and revel in, but they are not necessary to our initial enjoyment of the poem, nor to understanding a significant portion of what Dante is trying to communicate. It is this sense that makes Dante so translatable, a great boon to someone like me who has come to the great medieval poet's original Italian only recently, though I have walked with Dante's pilgrim many times. The very first thing a reader notices in the first line of the first canto of the first canticle is that this is a journey of our life, nostra vita. And Dante continues on throughout the remaining 99 canti to demonstrate in his very language that commonality. The language, no less than the subject matter, is for everyone. It is an eminently readable poem, even in translation, because every word is derived from nostra vita, from our shared experience of being human. Dante, more than any other poet, gets at the heart of what it means to be a fallen image-bearer, living in this world God made, and what it means for us sinners to be found by God and therefore find our way home. Writing from within that universal experience gives Dante both universal appeal and universal approachability, and in any language. Drawing just one more point from the lecture given at the Oxford Dante Society before letting Lewis go, all of this gives the comedy a feeling of effortlessness. Quote, I think Dante's poetry, on the whole, the greatest of all the poetry I have read, 
Yet when it is at its highest pitch of excellence, I hardly feel that Dante has very much to do. There is a curious feeling that the great poem is writing itself, or, at most, that the tiny figure of the poet is merely giving the gentlest guiding touch, here and there, to energies which, for the most part, spontaneously group themselves and perform the delicate evolutions which make up the comedy. End quote. Only a true master can make a masterpiece appear so masterless. Only the highest poet can make high poetry feel prosaic in the best sense, while maintaining poetic beauty and splendor. The Roman rhetorician Quintilian somewhere said, the perfection of art is to conceal art. Nowhere is this more true than with Dante's Divine Comedy. The pilgrim's journey down the funnel of hell, up the mountain of purgatory, and through the spheres of heaven, really is the journey of the soul to God. It is here that the deepest questions of our existence are dealt with and, thankfully, not left unanswered. It is here that we are confronted with what it means to be made in the image of God, how we distort that image, and how that image is restored. Here our relationships are examined, and the way we love one another can be challenged and transformed. Here we have the opportunity to be re-enchanted by the beautiful world God has made, to see everything as a living, breathing, and spoken word, a window through which we can see and love Him. Acknowledgements Beatrice exhorts the pilgrim in Canto 10 of Paradiso, Ringrazia, ringrazia, give thanks, give thanks. And so I do. For the translation work itself, I am extremely grateful for Charles S. Singleton's magisterial commentaries on the Italian text, as well as for Reverend H. F. Tozer's commentary on the same. Both were indispensable for understanding the many elisions, contractions, Latinisms, medievalisms, and otherwise abnormal syntax. For the rendering into understandable English prose, I am grateful for Derling's and Hollander's translations, as well as the classic Carlisle Oakey Wicksteed translation, as they provided me with guardrails to make sure I understood what was going on. Other favorite translations would include Anthony Esselin's blank verse and H.F. Tozer's prose rendition. I am grateful for Dr. Anthony Nussmeyer, University of Dallas, who has encouraged my own studies in Dante as well as brought me to the shores of the Italian language. Major thanks are due to Daniel Fukushan and everyone at Roman Rhodes Press for making this a reality. It is a pleasure working with them and taking part in furthering their educational vision. A special shout out to the indispensable Carissa Hale for making sure everything was right and proper, and for her really fun interior illustrations. And to Joey Nance for his absolutely stunning cover art. Furthermore, I want to give my sincere gratitude to Melissa Dow, for lending her own love and appreciation for Dante to this project. Her suggestions and corrections to the summaries and the translation make this a far better work than it would have been otherwise. I also want to thank my parents for listening to cantos as I finished them. Their support and encouragement has always been of inestimable value. More than all these, though, I give thanks to the Lord for my patient and enthusiastic wife, Jen, who has always been my biggest fan. Her love and support is what makes this project possible. As mentioned above in Canto Ten of Paradiso, Beatrice says, Give thanks, give thanks to the Son of Angels, who to this sphere of perceiving has raised you by His grace. Dante narrates his response. Heart of mortal was never so disposed to devotion, to give itself to God so swiftly with all its grateful assent, as I then made my own at her urging. Indeed, all my love fixed itself on him, that Beatrice was eclipsed and forgot. Paradiso, Canto 10, lines 52 through 60. I believe, and argue elsewhere, that this sits at the heart of Dante's project. This is what he wants for you, as you read through the comedy, a heart made so swift to give itself to the Lord in adoration and worship, that every means by which you arrive at that place is eclipsed and forgot. The final goal is not the accomplishment of reading Dante. It is not a complete understanding of the poem. It is not the educational context in which this is probably being read. Your final goal, as was the pilgrims, is the beatific vision. It is to see and know God, revealed through the face of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. To live in a state of gratitude and worship before our Maker and Redeemer. 
Everything in this world, this volume included, is a tool in his hands to accomplish that end. It is my prayer for myself as I continue to enjoy this poem and what it points to. It is my prayer for you as well. As Augustine of Hippo said in a different context, we bear the image of God not because the mind remembers itself and understands and loves itself, but because it can also remember, understand, and love him by whom it was made. And in so doing, it is made wise itself. But if it does not do so, even when it remembers, understands, and loves itself, then it is foolish. Let it then remember its God, after whose image it is made, and let it understand and love him. Or, to say the same thing more briefly, let it worship God, who is not made. Wherefore it is written, Behold, the worship of God, that is wisdom. And then it will be wise, not by its own light, but by participation of that supreme light. Note on the Summaries of the Inferno We provide summaries at the beginning of each canto for the sake of context and understanding. You will notice that they increase in length and detail the further you go. This was done intentionally in order to not crowd you, the reader, with too much not Dante while you get your feet wet. The best way to approach Dante is not first and foremost through other people's words, but by simply diving in. Therefore, only bare-bones summaries are provided at first. Obviously, more could be said about each canto. It is our hope to provide you with enough to get you going and provide context, but not so much that you feel you are reading the canto twice over. Later on, the summaries grow in size as longer explanations become integral to a proper understanding of the poem. However, even then, the introductory material is meant to supplement, not replace, your enjoyment of the text.